Thank you, Irene. Um, so I'm going to do the usual uh, start of cohort announcements and then we'll kick off with the bits that are different from every cohort call. So uh, good to have you all here. You've noted by now this call is being recorded. This is the seventh session of the Nebula, our very first pilot Nebula cohort, and we're so happy to have you here. Uh, so today we are talking about open code. Um, and the call after being recorded, we will add it on our YouTube channel. There are also captions available. So if you are um, what, watching this, participating at the moment uh, live rather than on YouTube, you can click on Otter AI. Um, and there were, um, this is, sorry, it's on the top of the screen. And you can click on live on Otter AI to actually open a transcript so that you can follow along with what I'm saying, even if you have the volume off or even if you're getting distracted or if you're hard of hearing or anything like that. Um, we also have the, a code of conduct. So hopefully by now, you know, the drill, we need to be awesome to one another. There are times when we are interacting on text in the chat or, um, in the etherpad, there are times when we are in breakout rooms, speaking or writing together. Um, and also there is the Slack and we ask you generally to be awesome to one another, treat other people the way that you would like to be treated. Um, and if you either um, experience or witness anything that you don't think is in line with that spirit, um, then please do speak to someone from OLS. This could be uh, using the team at weareols.org email address. Um, or if you prefer just to speak to an individual, there's many good reasons why you might do that. You can email myself, yo at weareols.org. Um, or Malvika or Irene. And if you're looking at the etherpad right now, that's lines 37 and 38 for the email addresses. Finally, um, we will be having one set of breakout rooms today. Um, and many of you already have done the thing, but uh, if you haven't, it would be great if you could add in front of your name, W, if you prefer a written breakout room, um, or S um, for speaking, if you prefer a spoken breakout room. And that just helps us to um, sort you into groups uh, according to your preferences. Um, that's everything, right? Um, Irene, I shall pass the baton to you. Thank you, Joe. So I will do a short recap of the program so far and a few announcements. Let me share my screen first. Um, share. Can you see that? Okay, great. So uh, we are in the midpoint of the cohort. Um, and we are, yeah, it went so, it's going so fast. But I'm really happy that we're at this point. Um, this week, we're going to cover open code. And specifically in this session, it's going to be an introduction um, to open code and a few uh, practices around open code. Um, and the second half of this module, we're going to see, uh, we're going to dive into some best practices for programming. And then we have um, next week, the uh, sessions on results. Um, so that could be uh, um, all the training sessions, but your coaching sessions are still ongoing. And um, at the end of this session, we just want to um, share a few announcements about what's going to happen on week six and seven, which is the final presentations. So don't worry about it. We'll um, we'll share detailed instructions about that. Um, for now, I just want to share this map. Um, and again, during this session, we're gonna um, hear about some of the concepts that we have been learning um, from the first session about open licenses, about um, repositories, and about documentation, but specifically in how they apply to open code. So that's where we are at the program right now. Let me stop sharing. And next, um, let me see the uh, notes. Yeah, so we can start with the presentation. Um, in the session, we have Johanna Bayer, who is going to be our expert. And I'm also really, really happy that 
Um, she's here with us. She's also part of the uh, um, team that originally developed the materials for NASA. Um, and that is really, really exciting as well. We're happy that um, some, some of the experts who have been joining developed those materials and are now giving this training. So uh, please, Johanna, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, start your presentation. Yes, sure. I think I'll start sharing my screen and you will see my very busy computer layout. You should be able to see my screen now. Um, yeah, so the session today will be um, an introduction to open code and um, yeah, about myself. Um, so my name is Jana. Um, I am a postdoctoral fellow in, at the Donders Institute for Brain Cognition and Behavior in the Netherlands. And um, I use machine learning models to create uh, normative models, which is a specific type of modeling um, on large neuroimaging data sets. And the idea is to find brain abnormalities that can maybe predict neurological or mental disorders. Um, I also study computer science part-time. Um, so I have basically a background in psychology and neuroscience, and now I'm getting a computer science degree. Um, I'm also involved in several open source and um, open science initiatives. So um, the OSIC, that's um, the uh, open science uh, group for the Organization for Human Brain Mapping, um, TOPS. Um, I'm co-organizing a podcast that is called datatalks.club. Um, I have contributed to several open source libraries, for example, scikit-learn. Um, I'm part of a group that organizes hackathons, um, so brainhack.org around the brain. And I've also contributed to the Turing Way book. Um, and I absolutely love cats. And you see my cat, Soxy, um, on the right. Uh, she's 17 years old, but she's so cute. Um, yeah, so um, today's session will be structured in two parts. The first one is an introduction to open code, and the second one is a bit about how to use code. Um, in the first session, we will look over like what is code, um, how does it different, um, how is it different from software, and how you can you share your code. And the second part will be how you can you use code that has been shared. Um, there will be as always two exercises, and I'm happy to take your questions. Um, you know, as you have them. Um, so feel free to post in the chat or just to raise your hand. Um, after this uh, session, you're, um, you should be able to define open source software and distinguish it from closed source software, um, list common benefits and challenges to the production of open source code, and um, describe how researchers can respond to some of the challenges while maximizing openness when appropriate. Um, yeah. Let me see, how can I move on? Yeah, and describe the function and purpose of a software management plan and its utility as um, a guidebook, guidebook for everyone involved in a scientific project. Um, let me see, yeah. Um, so we have two terms here, um, what is code and what is software? Um, so code is just a structured, structured language and it does not necessarily, necessarily be need to be computer specific. So if you think about Morse code, for example, um, but um, we talk about code um, basically when we write programs for a computer and code in the kind of more software um, kind of area or software, software specific code um, can be uh, on different levels. So you have um, high level code. That is the code that you write if you write an R script or a Python script. Um, and that's the code that humans can understand. Um, but then there is like um, machine level code um, that's basically in bits and byte, uh, bytes and hexadecimal language. And the human written code needs to be compiled into machine language code so that the computer can understand it. So machine language code is low level code. Um, and then we have software. Um, software is basically a lot of code bundled together. So it's a collection of programs, data, scripts, and code that can be bundled together and executed together. Um, and then we have open source software. Um, so open source software is software that is, is distributed with its source code without cost, making it available for others to use, modify and distribute with its original rights and permissions. Um, it's often transparently shared in a public repository and sometimes maintained through collaboration. Um, it is the basis for a vast range of research software packages. 
and it's often protected by a license that governs the sharing and the use of the software. Um, and I wanted to take the time to um, shed the light on uh, three figures that have um, mainly or contributed to the history of computing. Uh, in general, if you're interested in the history of computing, I can just recommend like reading up about like different people and contributions. It's really interesting. Um, and it also shows you, you know, the way from how it all started until how we got here. And also it, it, it helps you understand what a computer does basically. Um, so the first one is um, named uh, Ada Lovelace. Um, she was um, uh, um, a countess in England and she lived from 18 or 50, 1815 to 1852. Um, and she's seen to be, uh, she's meant, or she's considered to be the first programmer. Um, she attended a um, circle of um, scientifically interested people where she met a Lord, Lord Byron, and he developed kind of an analytical engine to make calculations. And she wrote ins instructions for these, um, this machine basically. So um, that's why she's seen as the first programmer. She wrote instructions for a machine, which is programming. Um, the second one is Grace Hopper, who was a general in the American um, military. She lived from 1906 to 1992. And um, due to Grace Hopper, we don't have to talk to computers in machine language anymore. So she invented the compiler, which makes it possible to basically translate from human written code. Um, in her case, it was COBOL, a, code, a language that we don't know anymore now. but. Same with Python. So she made it possible that we can um, write Python code and then something compiles the code into machine language. Um, and then on the right hand side, um, I have Margaret Hamilton. Um, uh, she's still alive, um, but she contributed um, the source code to the Apollo 11 module. Um, that is the, the Apollo mission that got us to the moon. And you see her here with basically all the code stacked up. And she wrote it completely in assembly language. Um, and I'll come back to Margaret later, but um, yeah, I think that's very cool. Um, and I just wanted to highlight these three figures. Um, cool. Um, so um, the kind of um, uh, open, core, open code and open software uh, field or mentality has some principles behind it. Um, it's kind of a bit of a manifesto or like, you know, values that stand behind sharing your code. Um, and uh, I've listed these values here and I want to go through them with you. Um, so the first one is transparency. Um, so that's the idea that we all have, um, we have the access to all the information and the materials that are necessary for doing our best work. And when these materials are accessible, we can build upon each other's ideas and discoveries, and we can make more effective decisions and understand how to how these uh, how those decisions affect us. So basically, we have access to all the information, and we are happy to give others access to all the information. Um, the second value is collaboration. Um, when we are free to participate, we can enhance each other's work in the un un unanticipated ways. When we can modify what others have shared, we unlock new possibilities. By initiating new projects together, we can solve problems that no one can solve alone. And when we implement open standards, we enable others to contribute in the future. Um, the third value is to share early and often. Um, rapid prototypes can lead to rapid discoveries. An iterative approach leads to better solutions faster. When you're free to experiment, you can look at problems in new ways and seek answers in new places. You can learn by doing. Then another value is um, inclusivity. Um, good ideas can come from anywhere and the best ideas should win. Only by including diverse perspective in our conversations can we be certain we've identified the best ideas and good decisions makers continually seek those perspective. You may not operate by consensus, but successfully work. successful work determines which projects gather support and effort from the community. Let me just move this bar out of the way. Um, and the th and last value is community. Um, communities from when different people unite around a common purpose. Uh, communities form when different people unite around a common purpose. Um, shared values guide decision making and community goals supersede individual interest and agendas. Um, and I personally have experienced that especially community is an important one. Um, so if you have ever used a library, um, for example, 
Um, usually you find a lot of people on the internet that use that library, that are very interested in a library that want to contribute to that library. Um, and it's actually really nice. And really nice uh, feature of open source work is these communities. Um, let me move on. Um, yeah, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, types of software that you might encounter. Also kind of pointing towards the questions that you might ask, like, is, is what I write, is that actually software? Is that actually something I should share? Um, because when I started out, there was like, oh, I'm writing, you know, these tiny R scripts, like, is that even worth sharing? Um, and we'll go through that now. So um, you might have encountered different types of software that might have shaped your idea of what software is. Um, so I guess the most common ones are general purpose software. Um, they are produced for wide use. They can be open or closed, so basically available or not, like without a license, basically. Um, that would be, for example, the Linux kernel, um, browsers, your Android operating system, and these types of software. So basically massive libraries. Um, and I think no one of us would identify with, you know, writing such a type, such type of software. It, you know, it's massive, mo millions of lines of code. Um, then we have operational or infrastructure software, still massive. And this is software that is used by data centers and large information technologies facilities to provide data services. We're talking about APIs, web apps, these type of things. Um, then we're already getting smaller um, libraries. I think this is something you know, where we're coming closer. Libraries are generic tools for implementing well-known algorithms, providing statistical analysis or visualization, which are incorporated in other software categories. And they're scholar, definitely. So examples would be scikit-learn, NumPy, Pandas, or ggplot. And if you work in a field where, um, you know, the software is the output of your research, you might have thought about, um, uh, you know, bundling your software into a library. Um, I'll see this some. Stuff in the chat. Is that something for me? Let me see. You're all good. Don't worry. Okay. We'll, okay. we'll raise it if there are any. Okay, um, cool. I know it can be distracting to check the chat. <laughs> no, cool. All good. Um, cool. Um, then we have modeling and simulation software. Um, that would be software that you use for an your analysis. For example, um, you know, if you model or if you need mathematical equations. Um, or if you uh, need to infer models from data, um, people often wonder, should I share that? And in that case, you wouldn't share the software, but, but you would definitely share um, the version of the software and like which software it is where to get it, basically. Um, analysis software, similar, that would be software that you use to analyze your data. Examples would be R and SPSS. Here you would also share, um, basically, which version of the software you used and which libraries you used for this, like to do your analysis. And then we get to what probably is what most of you, you know, should share, which is single use utility software. And that's written um, for use in unique instances, such as making a plot for a paper or manipulating data in a specific way. Um, this code often uses library for analysis, plotting or reading data gets included in open and gets included in open science and data management plans. Um, and to come back to my, my question at the beginning, should you share this? Definitely you should. Anything that you use to write to, to write a paper, to do analysis should be shared. Um, and you are actually writing software um, that should be shared. Um, cool. Um, and now we would already come to our first um, exercise. Um, I guess many of these topics might not be super new for you um, and you might have already thought about sharing your code and you might have already shared your code. So the exercise is about benefits and challenges of sharing code. Um, and uh, I want you to gather in breakup rooms and um, discuss what are general and personal benefits of sharing code. Um, uh, what are general and personal challenges of sharing code um, have you already shared code uh, why or have you not shared code why not and if you find a challenge for sharing code can you come up with a solution um, for that challenge should I stop sharing or do we still um, have that's, yeah. yeah I think if you stop sharing and yeah. maybe just post those prompts also yeah. into the chat that would be great yeah um, they're also before... on the etherpad so um, but I can perfect. definitely 
Just before we um, send everyone off, so I have the rooms ready. Uh, my one question would be, if someone's never written any code or they say, I don't write code, what would you tell them to do with this exercise? Um, it could also be around sharing documentation or sharing um, any software that you have used. So it could be, you know, your analysis software. Why would you share that? Why would you not share that? Um, You can also I, I think could... about, um, you know, if you've never shared code or if you don't write code, you can still think about what could be benefits or challenges. It doesn't, it can also be general. It doesn't need to be person specific. Okay. How long do we want? Uh, is it 10 minutes? I think we said seven, but seven to seven. 10 is fine. Yeah. Seven. Okay. Right. Rooms are opening now, my friends. Yeah, so Anna, over to you. Cool. Um, so I don't know how many breakout rooms did we have in the end? Four. Um, maybe if um from each breakout room, um, you could share um first what are um uh, benefits of sharing code. Do we have one someone from each breakout room to share that? I'm going to nominate Priya to go first. <laughs> Thank you, Yo. Actually, uh, we didn't uh, talk about the benefits of uh, open code, but uh, for me, code is uh, um, code itself is something new, uh, and I have never used it in my research. So the other two were one from uh, computer science and one from. Have and how the open code is uh, um, being um, useful for varying um, platforms. So it was more of a learning thing for me uh, for those five to seven minutes. So now it's time for me to work on, okay, how I can implement such platform in material science research. So I hope to do something. <laughs> but it was very informative and nice session back there thank you cool um you cut out like very briefly um but i hear that you are new to open code and that you learned a lot during the session cool um anyone else uh yes we yeah. did talk uh, about the benefit of sharing codes uh we mentioned two main points uh, one of them is the repro reproducibility yeah. Like if I have an experiment for my research, I want other people to, you know, produce the result that I got again, right? And uh, the other reason is that when we make our code open, so that people they would see how I built the code, they learn from it, and they may find mistakes and they may correct it, and they may inform me about it to make it better, make the the code better, right? So these are the only two reasons I think we came up with or we mentioned. Yeah. Okay, there's okay. definitely some good leads. Um, reproducibility, basically meaning that other people can, you know, redo what you did um, and also verify that it's correct what you did and then learning and improvement. Cool. Um, do we have, um, there are two more groups. I see in the chat um, one contribution from yep. Luciana from one of the grid and breakout yep. rooms. Um, it says, it is an opportunity to get feedback and improve what you are developing. Yep, exactly. Great. Um, and the last group. That leaves us with the group that had Austin, Joanna, and Vivian. Are any of you able to type anything in chat or unmute to share? Okay, so for my group, I had two people who hadn't had experience with coding. So I shared my reason for sharing. I wasn't too sure if that meant uploading to GitHub because that's what I do. But then you realize on social media where people I like, post a code, hey, I use this for that. I don't do that. But I upload to GitHub because I just want to create a backup and not because I instinctively or I'm consciously trying to share. So that's why I was asking what went into sharing itself. 
But personally, I put it up on GitHub for people to, I mean, to create a backup. But just in case someone chances on it and wants to learn, I leave detailed notes for them to figure it out. Yes, generally. Perfect. Yeah, it can be on GitHub. Um, I think I was a bit unspecific here because it could also be that you share it in your group. So many, some labs have, for example, code reviews where you go, you know, you have a, you meet in a room and you go through everyone's code. That could also be sharing your code. But definitely, I think GitHub is the most, um, you know, well-known way of doing it. And yeah, I, I agree. It's, you know, doing it just for yourself is a reason enough because future you usually doesn't know what past you did. <laughs> so at least for me, that's the case. And if you have like a nice... Uh, you know, repository. Uh, I know you're going to talk about version control next week, but or more, more about the specifics, more about the specifics. But um, if you have a nice, nice commit history, so basically on GitHub that allows GitHub allows you to make snapshots of your repository and then you know see go back in time to exactly how your file was at the status of your part, how your file was in in the past. Um, if you have something nice, you know, and if keep it updated, then you know you can exactly see what you did and why you did it. And, you know, if you do something wrong, then you can go back to a stage where it worked. Um, cool. Um, yeah, maybe let's move on with the presentation. I've also collected some uh, reasons why people share or don't share their code. Let me just share my screen again. Um, am I still here? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've um we've collected some of the replies that I have here already. Let me see. Yeah. So um benefits that I thought of, you know, they can be personal, general, that if you share uh, your code, that can be um, you know, just your analysis, if you make that, if you detail that what you exactly you did for your paper, um they get cited more often. Um, that's a fact. Um, there's increased credibility in um, your code um, because people can see exactly what you did. Um, a shared, like, you know, if you share code on your GitHub, GitHub is usually the place where, where it goes. Um, it's, um, it's a nice portfolio. So you have like different folders with different projects. You can share that with a future employer and they can see what you're able to do. Um, so that's that's one thing like if you don't have a github account yet i would i would recommend to you to get one um because it's quite you know well known and and yeah companies accept that on your resume um and yeah reproducibility the results of your paper are reproducible not only for others but also for future you um yeah and um you know you add to a code base that advances scientific progress in general so anything that you share um, means that someone else doesn't have to do it again. Um, then there are also some challenges. Um, so the first one would be that if you, you know, if you share a significant amount of code, like that would be even be a library, you will have to maintain it. There will be people coming, oh, this doesn't work for me. You know, can you help me? Um, and that can take quite a bit of time, of your time, basically. Um, people sometimes fear that some, some arguments that people make sometimes that they're getting scooped. You know, if you, um, put out exactly what you did that someone else just copies it, um, and, you know, without acknowledging you, but I feel like this has never happened to me actually. Um, <laughs> so I think that's, um, and usually the benefits of sharing your code, you know, if someone finds it, it finds it is interesting. What I've experienced is that people contact you and they ask you, you know, would you like to collaborate on something that we progress this further? So I've never been scooped. Um, um, and another thing that, or another uh, issue that I, or, or fear that I often hear is like that people think, oh my God, people might find errors in my code. Um, and then, I don't know, this is based, this kind of went into a paper. So then I'll have to take down the paper. Um, I don't, I also don't think that this um, can happen in that way. And if it does, I mean, yeah, uh, then, the, the paper there was an error in the paper so I think it's then better to you know to know that and to be open about it um yeah um and uh, yeah the other thing is it's of course also more work so you know to make your code nice um, make it understandable um you know write good doc documentation for your code takes more work than just doing your analysis filing your code away submitting it to a journal 
um, definitely. Um, yeah, I wanted to show you one very simple way of getting started with sharing your code. I know you're going to do version control next week, um, but um, the best way to do that is GitHub. This is the icon, icon of GitHub. It's called Octocat because it has a cat head and then it has some tentacles. <laughs> Uh, don't ask me why. Um, and um, so ideally, you know, you would start out with already GitHub committing into the repository, you know, a a creating this tr his trace history of your code um, while you code. Um, if you have not done yet, you can still share your code. The first step would be to get a GitHub account. Um, if you're absolutely not familiar with GitHub, I've here linked um, a link to a tutorial that I made, how you can learn GitHub. Um, it's a website, it's snapshots that introduces you to Git, or you can just wait for next week. <laughs> um, make sure your analysis um, or your software is numbered and well-documented. Um, I'll show you, in, show you in a second how simple this can be and how useful it can be. Um, in general, the better, your code is, the better organized and the better documented, the less description you need in your GitHub repo. Then upload the scripts to GitHub. Um, create a short readme. So a readme is a, um, basically a file that tells people what is in the repository, um, describe, describing the project and execution of the code. And add a license. We'll come to licensing in a second as well. And I'll, um, you can also share your data um, but not on GitHub. Um, GitHub is not for data. Um, it's limited to small files. Um, and even if you you cannot share your data, still share your code. So uh, sharing your code is not meant for others or not only meant for others, you know, to be able to execute the code right away out of the box. It's already helpful if they just see what you've done. Even, you know, many people can read code quite well. So they then see what you've done. That's already very helpful. Um, and I'll show you an example where I'm just preparing um, a, a repository that is, is going to be submitted with a paper of ours. Um, and you see that here, and um, this is GitHub for those of you who don't know how what GitHub looks like. So this is a repository on GitHub. And what I just did is like I, I numbered my files. Um, so there are step one, step one, step two, step three. Um, that means that they come up like in the right order in my repository. Um, and then I just say, okay, this is this is the code for the experiment in this paper. Um, I might still add a license and I might also add um, some requirements. So, you know, the version of the soft, the Python, the Python version and the libraries that I used um, for executing this code, but that's enough. That's, there doesn't need to be like a detailed, super detailed instructions. As long as it's there, like if people are interested and if they run into problems, they can contact you. Um, so this is as easy, you know, this is this is enough basically. Um, it's it's a first step. Um, cool. Um, yeah. Um, last but not least, let's also talk about there are definitely um, situations where you should not share your code. Um, and these can be, um, first of all, the code contains personal data. Um, let's say you have hard coded, I don't know, any patient information or it's, yeah, the code would in any way um, reveal information that you're not allowed to share. Then of course you cannot share it. Um, the second one is, you know, like very obvious stuff like, uh, military secrets or, you know, violates national interests or security concerns. Um, I do think, though, this should be clear. Like, you should, if that's the case with your data, you should know, I, I think. Uh, in general, still, it would be good to discuss with your superiors if you can share your code. Um, same here, if you want to pat patent something, um, don't share it before. Um, yeah, or if your organization um, forbids you to share the code, so always talk to you know, your supervisors or superiors. Um, also something that is very important um, to know about GitHub. So GitHub, because it creates this history of your files, um, if you upload something to GitHub, it will always be there and it will stay there. Even if you delete the file, it is in the Git history. So once you've uploaded 
a file there, it will always be there and it's always visible, at least for people who know how to find it. Um, so if you've uploaded a, a file that contains personal data, the only way is to delete the GitHub repository <laughs> to get it out of there. Um, one of my friends had to do that um, actually. And that's just a caveat. Yeah, so then let's talk about licenses. Um, so licensing is a whole can of worms and I'm not a lawyer. So this is definitely not you know, the ultimate advice, um, but it's a fact that um, you need um, a license on your code or your GitHub repository to um, tell people how they can um, work with it. Um, and if there's no license, this can lead to the fact that people definitely like people will shy away from using it because they don't know how um, and they will also not cite you they would rather scoop you you know if they don't know how to use your stuff and they still want to use this they might just find a very creative way of doing so because they don't know how um, there are different types of licenses and they can range from restrictive to liberal um, so-called copyleft copyleft is kind of a creation that is based on copyright so basically copyright is no permissions copyleft is the opposite um, and um, so there's the public domain license. This is just a, a small um, fraction of licenses. There are a couple. Um, and I um, linked here um, uh, the, the path to a license finder website where you can, if you're looking for a license that fits your, suits your, fits your purposes, you can go there and it's kind of a little decision tree that will guide you to a license that works for you. Um, so there's the public domain license that grants all rights. So you can do anything with that code. Examples are the CCO uh, license. Then there's the permissive license um, that grants use rights um, and forbids almost nothing. It allows proprietarization and also commercialization. Um, so this would be these type of licenses. Um, I often use the MIT license. Um, then there's copyleft licenses. That's an, an interesting one because it grants use rights but forbids proprietization, which basically means you can do anything um, with that code, but it can never be closed. So you, uh, you can anything with the code and derivatives, but you can never make it so that this needs a license. It has to stay in the open domain, basically. And GPL and AGPL licenses are examples for that. And then there's, you know, the commonly known proprietary, proprietary license, which is basically copyright. So that means, you know, your MATLAB license where you need a license to use MATLAB, basically. Um, cool. Um, let's also just talk very briefly about software management plans. Um, so they are the best way to share code and they are basically the idea is that before you do anything, before you start coding, you think about how to, you know, develop, maintain, and how your code should be used. Um, and it, the software management plan is a document that describes how a specific software project is developed, maintained, and curated. It's written by the developers, maintainers, and other stakeholders of a software project. And the goal of a software management plan is to ensure that the software is usable and maintainable in the long term. Um, so um, I just wrote a grant that in which I tried to get um, funding for one of the libraries or the, the toolboxes that I maintain as part of my work, and they were asking us for a software management plan. Um, and these are um, some parts or some uh, yeah uh, things that you need to be described in the software management plan. So the first one would be describing the overall purpose of your software. Then there's the engineering focus. That's basically focus on the you know the development of the code. So how it is how is it version controlled? How is the test coverage? Um, is it how does the packaging work? Um, what is the architecture of the code? How is it you know structured? Is that uh, maintainable and like is that efficient? Um, then there is a focus of, on of on documentation. Um, so you need user documentation. So documentation for the people who want to use your software. Um, development documentation. Uh, so documentation for people who want to contribute to the software. A deployment. That's deployment. Um, so basically, people who want to launch your software and development um, documentation. The people who want to contribute to your software. And then. There is um, another focus on uh, project management um, that contains um, 
uh, uh, sub items such as um, how is your code maintained? So what is the idea? Like, are you going to employ the employ someone who is going to maintain your code long term? Is that going to do some? Is that a, a postdoc of yours that is going to do that? Um, how is that? You know, uh, how is the software maintained? Like, how is the repository structured? Um, how do do I cite your software? Um, what resources are available and what dependencies um, are, in, you know, software usually depends on libraries, like what are these? Um, what is the license that is on your software? And then risk analysis, that is also an interesting one that people usually don't think about, but let's say you develop software for in the finance sector that predicts, I don't know, whether you should invest in some stock. Um, and then you make, you know, you make a prediction and uh, people invest based on your software, the prediction of your software, and then they lose money and you get sued. <laughs> um, stuff like that. Uh, that should be in, in the risk analysis part. Um, yeah, and uh, then I wanted to touch on uh, a different aspect that I came across. So open code, uh, code in the time of LLM, LLMs. Um, so um, I don't know whether you know that, but at the moment, all code on GitHub is being used to train LLMs. Um, and the lat latest example is the stack. So that's a new LLM model um, by the Hugging Face, and they are currently scooping GitHub. Johanna, yeah. um, could I just ask you to explain what LLM is? Ah, yeah, uh, large language models, such as uh, ChatGPT. So as you all know, uh, ChatGPT, um, uh, is based on basically the, the entire internet and they are extending it on the code that is on GitHub. Um, so the Hugging Face is a company, they develop uh, similar models uh, such as, yeah, it's called the stack in this case, um, and they are training it on GitHub code. And you can, if you click on this link, it will get you to uh, this kind of window. Um, and you can actually see if you have a GitHub account, whether you're in their training data set. I did that for my code, for my repository, and I found six of my repositories in their training data set. And at the moment is uh, it's an opt out um, approach. So they allow you to opt out if you don't want uh, the stack to be trained on your code. But yeah, that's just, that's just a reality that you know, these things are happening and, and you need to be aware of that. Like if you have any data or any code that you, you know, needs to be unseen, you know, that, that, that cannot be shared or you don't want to be part of a, of ChatGPT, for example, or like, you know, larger LMM, LMMs, then um, you should not upload it to GitHub. Um, and another caveat is like, um, at the moment also uh, ChatGPT, so at least if anything that you, you know, upload or load into the free version goes right into the training data set. Um, so I would not upload my thesis or my unpublished article and ask ChatGPT to write me an abstract because that means it's in there. Um, and then you might have to, it's even worse because you might have to prove that, you know, you gave it to ChatGPT and not ChatGPT gave it to you. So there might be claims that this was written by ChatGPT because you fed it in there. I would not do that. But it's my personal um, opinion. Okay. Um, cool. Um, There's a couple of questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does yeah. this apply to private repositories? Um, no. Uh, I think private repositories are they're private, but um, you pay for private repositories unless you have like a, a university account or something like that. But definitely public repositories. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so then we'll come to the end of the first section um, and um, some key takeaways. Um, making software more open has benefits and challenges, um, which are often related. Um, greater benefits typically come with uh, greater challenges. Um, and in most cases, individual scientists and society will both benefit from more open software. Cool. Um, so then let's move to the second part. Um, using open code. So the objective for this part, which will be shorter actually than the first one, um, is uh, to you should be able to describe the process of using open code and know some key repositories to find code. Um, describe the four key considerations when assessing open software, functionality, interoperability, security, and licenses. 
and describe how, where, and under which circumstances would should, should acknowledge one should acknowledge or cite code. Um, so um, I've listed here some like sources where you can find open code, and I think you probably know most of them. But you can, if you want to, just you know, I link them so you can go through them if you want to. The first one is GitHub. Um, I, I hope I think many of you know GitHub already. It's a massive um, repository for code. You have your own little folders in there, and you can upload code. But you can also browse other people's code. Um, GitLab is similar but smaller. They're actually not related, <laughs> um, so they're two different companies. <clears throat> Bitbucket, Bitbucket is uh, similar. Um, also, another company that basically a platform that hosts code or repositories. Um, one uh, so source or resource that I really like is Papers with Code. Um, so they basically collect papers that contain code. Um, I really like that because um, for me, I'm not, I mean, I have a hard time reading math. And if I want to understand something, I need to see how it's implemented. So then I go, you know, to the paper, but then I can go to the repository that where the implementation is. Um, so that's that. Let me see that. Um, yeah, the Journal of Open Source Software um, is a journal that um, <laughs> that I'm currently actually editor of, um, and there they basically publish code. So each of their publication has a very short like paper. It's only two pages, but then the uh, the actual publication is code. So if you're interested in finding libraries or you know also reading how library like figuring out how libraries are structured, you can go to the uh, to the repository um, of the Journal of Open Source Software. It's fully managed and maintained on GitHub. The entire review process is on GitHub. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's also a great resource. Um, Stack Overflow, of course. Um, and um, what I've done in the past is reverse engineering packages. So a package that you download from CRAN, like R, it's an R package, or from um, PyPy is just a folder on your computer. And as soon as you find this folder, you can open it and look at the scripts that are in there um, and see how, how code is written by other people, basically. Um, and then I wanted to show you, coming back to Margaret Hamilton, actually. Um, I told you she worked on the source code for the Apollo mission. Um, she worked on the command module and on the Luna module. And it happens to be that all the code that she wrote has been um, collected and is now in a GitHub repository, which blows my mind, but I'll show you here. Um, so this is again GitHub, this is Apollo 11 uh, repository. Um, and you see here, okay, here you have uh, a readme that says, basically, this is the Apollo 11 uh, repository. And then you have here um, a command um, folder and a luminary folder. So this is for the commando module. Um, and this is for the lunar module. So the one that actually went to the moon and you can click on that. And then you see here the actual files that they used. And you see they are written in assembly code. So that's the, you know, the ending is it's assembly and you can open it. And then you see here, oh, a lot of documentation here, so much documentation. Do they have any code in that one? Yeah. Here you see the actual assembly um, instructions. So that would be, you know, load a number into register, whatever, um, divided by, yeah, you know, very, very low level machine. Assembly is one level above bits and bytes. Um, so basically, you know, electrical signals. Um, and yeah, um, Margaret Hamilton contributed to that. I think she mo actually wrote most of it, which is pretty crazy. Um, yeah, but all these things you can find on GitHub. Um, I just wanted to show you that as well. Um, cool. Done that. Um, yeah, so then I've um, linked here some other repositories where you can find code. Um, uh, one very interesting one is the Software Heritage Repository. Um, we all know that, you know, code is developing and we've been writing code actually since the 50s um, and uh, a lot of great code is not in use anymore but the software heritage um, foundation they um, you know they archive this code basically and also probably like the Apollo 11 uh, code would be in here there are a couple of other ones 
um, that I'm not going to go in too much into. Many of you might be familiar with PyPy, the Python um, packaging uh, uh, repository, and then CRAN. If you're into Perl, there's also something similar to Perl. Um, yep. Um, yeah, so um, let's assume you want to use someone else's code. Um, I have here four general considerations um, for assessing you know, the quality of open source software. Um, and um, the, the, uh, the first one is functionality. Um, and that includes, um, yeah, is it useful for your scientific problem, but also, you know, does it work and what does it actually do? Um, I would always look and try to look into, um, you know, what is actually happening and how does it work? Um, interoperability, how hard will it be to use? Like there's definitely a trade-off, you know, if you're not so familiar with code, you might use some analysis software that is more GUI-like um, and maybe not go for the, you know, terminal version of the software. Um, security, is it safe? Um, it's actually an interesting one because I think few people consider that, um, that probably most of the packages that we upload, you know, that individual contributors upload to um, repositories can be super easily hacked <laughs> and they're not safe. But um, I guess like for most of our purposes, um, it's fine um, to use those. And then uh, licenses uh, or restrictions, um, can you actually use it? So does the license allow you to use um, the code in the way that you want it to use? Um, cool. Um, so yeah, citing. Um, there has been quite some development around making code citable. That is also was kind of, um, how do you say, uh, promoted or, you know, um, pushed by people who write um, mostly code as their research output because, um, you know, everybody cites paper, but then if your focus is writing packages, um, you know, people just can't cite that. And so um, there have been like efforts to make code citable. Um, and when should code, uh, open code be cited? Um, uh, the first um, the first reason would be that it has played a critical part in your research. So when you use, for example, um, a software to analyze your data, you should definitely cite that. Um, it provides something novel. Um, so um, similar, similar idea, um, just cite that. Um, it impacts the results of your analysis. And that is actually, in my field, a very important one because I, I work a lot with new images, so with images and um, the results of some of some analysis definitely depend on the software that you use. Um, so there, it's it's very important in my field to exactly um, document what you've done um, so that people can reproduce it. Um, and how should code be cited? So ideally, um, the code is located in a long-term repository and that tagged with a DOI. Um, and um, uh, packages also come um, sometimes with a paper that can be cited, but if you can cite the repository, that's better um, because, you know, the paper, it, it gets published, but then usually the repository um, continues to be developed and worked on. Um, and ideally, um, the repository or the, the package comes with a version tag that you can add to your citation. So a version tag would be um, like it, it uh, snapshots the repository um, basically and, and tells um, a reader or a user exactly what the state of the repository was when they uh, used it basically. Um, and then I have, have here some examples on how to uh, cite software. So if you purchase software off the shelf, you can just cite it in a way like product name, version, release date, publisher, location. Um, as, as in this example here. Um, if you download software from the web, you can use product name, version, release date, publisher, location, DOI, or download date um, as here. And then if you um, check it out from a repository, um, you use pu product name, publisher, um, so that would be a person, URL, checkout date, and repository specific checkout information. So that would be something like, you know, um, the name, then the, the authors, the repository and then for git for example you would say okay which branch do you use or which version did you use um, and uh, the date um, 
Cool. Um, so now we come uh, to our second exercise. Um, and I think we could do that maybe um, in the, you know, in the in the group. So not go into uh, breakout rooms. But um, I would like you to think about a concrete example, like a project that you're working on um, or some research that you're doing. Um, and what are two concepts um, or next concrete, no, what are two next concrete steps towards making your code um, or your analysis or your documentation um, for this project shareable? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll stop sharing and I'll put that in the chat again. Okay, so in line 156 of the notepad, we have a space for you to um, share your answers. Um, yeah, and the prompt is also there in the in the notepad. So we're gonna give a few minutes yep. for you to think about one of these steps, and then we will come back to the well. Come back and, to the discussion. Yeah, shareable can also mean reproducible. So basically, that's you know, yeah. Should we record? Should we pause recording for a bit or? Leave it on. Mm. We can. Let's leave it on. Okay, let's, let's leave it on for two minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me see. Let me go to the heater pad as well. Seen some really nice examples already. Makes me very happy. So maybe I can start reading out of them, uh, some of them out loud because they're really great. Um, so sharing not just the succeeded steps of the project, but also share the mistakes encountered and challenges faced along the way. That similar steps are not carried out again by someone else. That's great. Um, justifying design decisions, exactly. Um, that's actually a really good point. Like um, often we see, you know, just the way the final product, but we don't see why other, you know, decisions have not been made. So we don't see, and just saying, okay, we tried this, this, and this, we decided on this, but we also tried this, this, and this, and we just, that that's really a great uh, piece of advice, actually. Um, organize the data and the project in a shareable way, definitely. Uh, open a GitHub project page, yes. GitHub projects are great, um, I hope. Someone will talk about this next week, but they're great. <laughs> um, uh, licenses, placing licenses, great. Um, um, writing a script um, to um, streamline things, great. Yeah. And actually up uploading it to GitHub, you know, exactly. So, um, don't feel shy, that's great. Um, 
Docker, Docker containers, great. That is definitely a good way to, a very advanced way to make um, code executable, um, executable um, way beyond, you know, what this presentation wanted to, uh, um, you know, deliver, but um, definitely, definitely the way forward. Share an Excel spreadsheet I used to make a co color coded table, great, yeah. Cool. Um, yep. Yeah. Give clear project steps that will ensure the repositability. Great. Nice. Um, making sure that all mod modules and units in my code are reusable, no hard coded mod hard hard coded code. That's also great piece of advice. So modular code um, using variables. Um, yeah, I would love, love to talk more about clean code, which is also like kind of a passion thing about like that I have. But um, I was I was asked to talk about open code. So <laughs> um, maybe next time. Um, but uh, writing good code is an art, definitely. Um, and also like there's lots of opinions on it. So um, it's a good discussion piece. Lovely. Um, thank you all for your contributions. Um, I'll maybe go back to my presentation. We're almost done, um, but uh, let me see. Mm -hmm. The etherpad. And like, yeah, we're really almost done. Pretty much done. <laughs> but um, I, uh, what I wanted to share with you is like that this presentation is fully reproducible. Um, so you might have seen that it's, you know, it has less fancy pictures and it's a bit more structured thing. The reason is that it's basically fully based on code. Um, I'll show you here. It's in a GitHub repository. Um, I have written it in R with a library called Quarto and Reveal.js. Um, and it creates this presentations.html file, which you can just open in your browser. Um, and I'll show you the, how the R code looks like if you're interested in that. So that's that's how it looks like. Um, that's the, the source of my presentation and you can just render it and it will compile. Um, yeah, I've uploaded all this to, to GitHub. Um, yeah, but uh, let me go back to, I think now it's time for questions and discussions and yeah, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Um, we have a couple of questions. And um, so the first one is in the chat. Um, and it's Priya is asking about security issues when sharing open code. And in particular, um, what kind of security restrictions or kind of measures are should be considered um, or should be put in place when sharing open code? Uh, that's a really good question. So I think the first the first thing you need to do is definitely um, ask your supervisor if you can share the code. I think that's for you the biggest you know risk is that you share something that you're not meant to share. Um, like I said, everything that is on GitHub is openly available. Um, if you put a license on your code, um, you should be covered for most security risks. That's also a good reason to put a license. So the most most licenses, or actually all licenses, they clear you from all liability. Um, so that is also a good option. Apart from that, um, yeah, maybe you know, make clear that is like code, you know, code in development. Um, I would also. Uh, I have a friend who actually writes code um, for stock market predictions, and I would not do that. <laughs> um, does that answer you? I, I don't think that, you know, um, if you share your analysis code, um, I don't think there's much that can go wrong. Like, it's just you trying to explain better what you did. Um, I don't think anyone would attack you for that. If you, As soon as you're sh selling, selling stuff or, um, you know, if you're packaging stuff, like you know upload something to 
pi by, then I would be would test a bit more um, secure, like thoroughly what the code is doing. What you can also do is like you can run tests. So that's another um, thing that you can do, like test driven development, basically that makes sure that your code does what it is meant to do. Um, but yeah, that's what I would do. Okay, we have a joke. Can I offer one other comment about the security? Um, yeah. Just generally thinking, um, much like when we're cautious about where we share our data, yeah. um, think think about the uses, um, and but think think about the misuses. If you signed into your email, and someone said this thing has just been done with your code, and you turn white and go, Ooh! okay. Uh, don't don't just spend all your time thinking about miserable scenarios. But for example, if I was researching with interviews um, and they were supposed to remain anonymous, then I would be more cautious about the security of any code that I wrote around that. Um, so I guess just mapping out the consequences of what happens if it gets out helps you realize how much security that you need to put in. It's probably the way I'd put it. Um, like mission critical for the space shuttle, you probably want it to be pretty secure. Exactly. Okay, so we have two more questions. The first is, um, if I share my code with an AGPL license on GitHub, then someone copies and uses that for commercial purposes, how will I ever know this? And if I do, what can I do about it? Yeah, good point. Um, there are licenses that forbid commercial use. So if you don't want that, you, you can put such a license. Um, otherwise, you cannot do much about it. Like, it, like the only thing is like, um, there are, like I said, these licenses that basically say that anything that is done, like anything, any either the code or the, any derivative of the code cannot be commercialized and cannot be closed. So it has always, you know, the, whatever they do, they need to offer it to everyone again. Um, that is one type of license. The other type of license that you can then, um, you know, just put on your repository is one that forbids commercial use. Then you're secured against that. And then you can, you know, take legal actions if that's very important for you. I had uh, like a very interesting experience. Like I very briefly worked for a very shady startup. Um, and the reason they wanted me <laughs> is that they wanted me to take my supervisor's code, rewrite it in a different language and then use it for their purposes. And they said to me, like I said, I, ca I cannot do that. Like there's many reasons why I cannot do that. The first one is that this code belongs to the university. It's not mine. So, you know, and it's in the public domain. Like that was, that was the coverage of the license that said you cannot do that because you cannot use the code and then sell it. Like that was kind of part of this license. And they said like, yeah, just rewrite it. Everyone does that. Like you write it in a different language. Then nobody, you know, everyone does that. And I said, no, thank you. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> So um yeah. Apparently, you know, that's how some people do that, but you will always have these people. Um yeah. I I still try to believe in the good in in the good in people. So yeah, and I also know that because you mentioned issues with with large language models, and I know that there have been some discussions of those models using code that had licenses for non yeah. for just not commercial purposes. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a still an ongoing discussion. At least you can le take legal actions then. So if you definitely, if you have a license then you can say, okay, I'll sue this person um, in theory. Okay, so we still have a few minutes for another question. Um, first I want to, okay, this is an interesting one about scooping. Um, is it normal to feel guilty for using someone's code as you found it in your project? Um, I guess this goes, I want to connect this to another comment uh, in the um, in the bad about someone sharing that uh, they initially felt shy about sharing open code and they no longer feel that way after learning some of the open practices. Um, but these are two related points in that there's a lot of like emotions that come with sharing or yep. using open code just because yep. it's open. Do you have yep. any insights about this? Yeah. So for using open code, you can 
overcome this guilt very easily by just telling, you know, citing it. Um, similar that you would you would use insights from a paper, you just cite that, um, tell tell the world that you've used this code. And if if the license permit it permits it, there's absolutely no need to be ashamed. And I mean in the end, you know, it's kind of we are all a product of the things that we see, that we read. We all learned to code somewhere. We all learned to write somewhere. It's kind of an artist thing, right? Like an artist is also just a product of all the other art they have consumed. So in the end, you will consciously or not consciously use code or like ideas that you found somewhere. I think that's just normal. But like if you copy like, you know, pages of code <laughs> from another repository, then just make it clear. Like there's nothing really bad about it. About um, sharing code, it's definitely hard. Um, and, uh, but like my experience was that a, my papers where shared code got more, um, attention. And then usually it triggers like people reaching out to you, you know, if they, it, I've never had that. They said it's wrong. Like, it's more like, hi, can you use me, help me using this? I don't understand how to use it. Can you help me? Can we work together on this? Um, I think, I also think that. I would not, um, yeah, there's a, I, I would always, that's also like, you know, when you're really in the development phase of, of your code, then you make like a lot of, there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of, um, you know, committing, deleting. I would only sh share or make my code public like when it has like a certain maturity usually, because it's then also confusing for anyone who reads this to see all this, like <laughs> this massive commit history. Um, so if you, you know, go with that, like put it out there as soon as you think it has some flesh to it. <laughs> um, yeah, I know it's hard, but I also think like it's it's a process um, and you get more comfortable and we can also only learn, um, you know, if we share and if we, um, if people cannot point out our mistakes. So usually people are very kind. So like, I've never had like anyone say, oh, this is stupid what you did. Um, and I come from psychology, so I started coding from scratch when I was 20. So yes, definitely still hope for you guys. <laughs> um, so I learned it, yeah. Like I said, I'm studying computer science now, but I my degree is in psychology. So. Thank you so much, Johanna. And I think that point uh, also applies to open science in general. Like that's the spirit of open science. Um, there are a few more questions in the chat, but I'm gonna encourage people to share that on Slack and continue the conversation there because we are almost at the end of the session. So now uh, please help me give Johanna a round of applause. This was an amazing, an amazing session. You guys, you, it Johanna. was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to learn more about how I created the presentations, also I'm happy to share about that because it was a lot of fun actually. <laughs> and uh, I did that for the second time. Um, and it's just such a fun tool, um, yeah. Okay, so um, I have a few final announcements. So we will have the second half of this module on Thursday and tomorrow, Wednesday and on Friday, we also have open office hours. You're welcome to bring your questions, to uh, brainstorm ideas for your project. Um, it's really just a space for you to come. It's very casual. You don't need to prepare anything and you don't have to stay for all of it. And I'm going to share my screen just a bit. Um, can, you, can you see that already? OK, so. Uh, Two announcements is that we are offering a program extension. I know that for some of you, the coaching sessions are just started and we want you to have like the full five sessions. So for that reason, we are um, moving one of the final presentations, um, slots for the final presentations uh, to week seven. And then in week eight, we're gonna have like a wrap up session that's gonna be just a celebration for your participation in the program. Um, so again, initially we were considering to do the final presentations all in week six, and we are moving that to week six and week seven. 
So um, we're going to share all the details in that email, but I wanted to um, say that here in the, in the call. And I know that you have also been asking about what are those final presentations? So please don't stress about it. We just want to hear um, what you work on during the program, what you learned, and what are your next steps. Um, these presentations are going to be just five minutes. Um, and really, that's the um, uh, biggest requirement is that you stay under five minutes. I know that some of you might want to be, um, might want to share that all of what you did and might want to take more time, but really just five minutes will be more than enough. Um, and again, like we will share the link to um, for you to decide whether you want to present on week, in week six or week seven. So please wait for the email, um, I think later in the week um, with all the instructions. But again, please just uh, don't worry about it. As you go into your coaching sessions, just try to keep in mind what you would like to present um, for everyone here to, to learn what you did and what you learned. Um, yeah, so this is the, these are the short announcements. I'm gonna stop my share. And I see that there is a question, Ezra's. Okay, thank you, Irene, for letting me ask the question. It's about the project we are supposed to present at the end. I'm afraid I won't be able to complete within the time of the program. Uh, what am I supposed to do in this case? Yeah, so you don't have to finish your project um, what you're going to present is what you did and any steps it, that you took um, to make progress on that project. And maybe that is just having a better um, idea of uh, following the steps. That is enough. Um, really, like this final presentations are going to be very casual. You're welcome to prepare slides, but you're also just welcome to um, open your mic and share what you learned, what you work on, and your next steps. Um, it's not something that we're going to grade or anything like that. We just want to hear what you were able to uh, work on during the program. Um, it, it could be just a final reflection. And yeah, as Joe is saying in the chat, talk about this uh, with your coach and they will be able to reassure you um, about what you can present. <laughs> that makes it less scary, thank you. Yeah, it's not this scary at all, really. It's just for you to share and for all of us to learn from you as well um, what you did. Um, so are there any final questions? Okay, um, I'm gonna stop the recording now. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Johanna as well. Thank you everyone, it was really great.